Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems to be. We get 118 chemical elements, hydrogen through organocin, 118 different building blocks for chemistry. In reality, there are even fewer than that available to drive compounds and materials. Some elements are in short supply, and some only exist for a fraction of a second under specially controlled conditions. Legos are available with almost 4,000 different shapes and colors. But with chemistry, humans have been limited to roughly 100 building blocks. Everything we've ever seen in the cosmos, rock through our bodies to the sun, all out of just about 100 chemical elements. Or at least that's what scientists were working with before the concept of metamaterials. Historical ages have been defined by the materials, by humans' ability to creatively construct and shape the solid form. The Stone Age started when some clever early humans realized some rock was harder and more durable and could be used to break, grind, and sharpen other rocks into useful forms. There has even been recent evidence of some chimpanzee communities achieving the same state. While early humans were hunting around for the hardest rocks, they noticed something amidst the dirt, minerals, and cave crystals, something different. The rare and unmistakable sight of the luster of metal ignited the imagination and started the Bronze Age, the beginning of metallurgy, in around the year 3000 BC. This period is also tied to improvements in ceramic techniques and pottery kilns, leading to the ability to fire at temperatures higher than what's possible with a typical wood fire. The low melting points of tin, copper, and their alloys, the bronzes, made them accessible for melting and casting into durable tools, artwork, weapons, and armor. This is a case of technology igniting the fire of human ingenuity and driving social and cultural development. However, in around 1200 BC, there was a widespread drought and disruption in the world tin trade resulting in what's referred to in history as the Bronze Age Collapse and the beginning of a period that historians affectionately refer to as the Dark Ages. A total stagnation in science, culture, and the arts. It was a time of stupid medieval lords and peasant folk with leprosy. Dumb knights with horses and lances. You could be called a wizard or a witch if you knew how to boil water. The Dark Age was a shit time, all because technology was lost. It's a profound understatement to say there was a need to develop an alternative to copper tin alloys, and it took some time for this to happen. The Iron Age started around 500-ish BC. Wrought iron materials had been available, but the brittle mechanical properties, difficulty in working and forming, and the lack of durability made them unsuitable for, applica for most applications and therefore pretty uncommon. The invention of steel, which is really just iron and a little bit of carbon soot, is where the industrial age really got moving. Steel is a case of the special sauce, the sauce being carbon, really setting the recipe off. It's the strength and durability of steel that's held concrete, bridges, buildings, and cities together for centuries. Humankind went a long time without getting to the next step. It took the industrial revolution to kick things into the silicon age. Vacuum tube transistors existed, but making computers out of them was next to impossible. It was truly a heroic act. If you have a hundred vacuum tubes, they could all be brand new. Still, probably at least one of them is about to burn out and fail. Reliability is not their thing. They consume ungodly amounts of energy to operate. They're huge and can't be easily miniaturized. A modern computer, computer or phone processor has something like 60 billion transistors packed on the small chip inside. This would never have happened if we were stuck with these goofy things. I do have to admit, Vacuum tubes are kind of cool, and you can still find them in some specialty applications like guitar amplifiers and other kinds of audio processors. It took the availability of ultra-pure silicon to make solid-state transistors a reality. Make a tiny vacuum tube inside of a crystal using a few atoms of semiconducting silicon. This requires a kind of purity not found anywhere in nature. Until around 1950, even the most advanced chemical purification methods couldn't supply engineers with the quality silicon needed to make a transistor. It took a keen insight to accomplish that. A clever and beautiful concept, the zone refining. This relies on a clever trick and thermodynamic forces to slowly drive the impurities to one side of a processed silicon ingot. It's due to the natural tendency of a crystal to purify and perfect itself as it forms. Zone refining relies on repeated melting and recrystallization 
each heating pass making the crystal purer and purer. The ability to purify elemental silicon down to 99.9999 and even purer percent, coupled with the evolution of photolithography, led to transistors outnumbering humans many times over. Could we be moving from the information age to some new phase in the evolution of material science? Maybe a new stage with the kind of devices and functionalities beyond my current imagination. If we are, it might involve an entirely different class of materials, substances termed metamaterials. So what defines a material? It's more than just the individual chemical elements that make it up. It's about their interplay, their relationship to one another, their interaction with fields and forces in the environment. This is what defines a material. Scientists may only have 100 or so building blocks, but maybe there's a way to trick the system. If you really understand the invisible forces at work, if you know light well enough, maybe you can control, confine, steer, and manipulate it the way you want. Maybe you could even make something invisible. Magic can happen when two different materials come together. Many times, the second material can simply be air or empty space itself. Light passes through glass in a very similar way as it does through air or a vacuum. The interesting physics, reflection, refraction, scattering, occurs when light encounters the surface, the change. The interface between air and glass is, in a way, another material entirely. If you look up the definition of metamaterial in the dictionary, it'll mention something about man-made or artificially imposed structure. That's not entirely true. There are examples of natural metamaterials. A more rigorous definition would be composite materials with features at sub-wavelength scales, creating emergent electromagnetic and other physical phenomena not reducible to the constituent elements. Opals are naturally occurring silicate minerals, long recognized as valuable gemstones. In ancient times, the value of opals was ranked second only to emeralds by the Romans. The striking optical effect, opalescence, is due to the presence of a sub-microcrystalline mineral called crystobolite. Crystalline silicon and oxygen forming tiny crystals that vary in size between 400 and 800 nanometers, just the right size to interact with visible light, to striking effect. The structure of spider silk has been described by chemists and crystallographers as a labyrinth. The geometry is complex, near impossible to synthesize, and the perfect balance of chemistry, creating something lightweight and strong, almost beyond imagination. The amazing mechanical properties of spider silk come down to the perfect atomic structure. Spiders make the best chemists, apparently. Humans were using metamaterials before they realized what they were doing. They just knew it worked. They knew something was going on. An early example of man-made metamaterials are stained glasses. The color of stained glass is due to a quantum mechanical plasmonic effect from tiny particles of gold, silver, and platinum held inside the glass. These metal particles are so small that they no longer look or act the way metals do in bulk. They become something different altogether. Glass itself has a sea green color from the presence of dissolved calcium and other ions. No organic dyes were available that would survive the temperatures necessary to process glass before the modern era. And until recently, it was a bit of a mystery how ancient stained glass was prepared. It turns out the bright reds, blues, and oranges are due to gold and other precious metal particles of just the right size, quite a tiny size, right around the size of the wavelengths of the light making up visible light, nanometers, way smaller than a regular pebble. The phenomenon of optical refraction is familiar and common in everyday life. Light is constantly moving from one material to another, reflecting and refracting. In just about every case in normal life, the refraction takes the form of what people in optics refer to as positive refraction. The light always bends a certain way. But what if we could get light to do the opposite? Negative refraction. Or zero index refraction. Materials with indexes of zero have been fabricated. The physical and technological implications of this are more than significant. Materials with these strange properties certainly open up possibilities. Possibilities like a real-life Harry Potter invisibility cloak. 
I'm going to read from an article in, from Light Science and Applications, published in uh, August of 2018 by Hong Chen Chu. The title of the article is A Hybrid Invisibility Cloak Based on Integration of Transparent Meta Surfaces and Zero Index Materials. The Invisibility Cloak, a long standing fantastic dream for humans, has become more tangible with the development of meta materials. Recently, Meta surface based invisibility cloaks have been proposed and realized with significantly reduced thickness and complexity of the cloaking shell. So, this article goes on to, to talk about actually real implementation of this technology. Plasmonic antennas can turn light into electricity and back into light again. Zero and negative index optical materials can confine light to sub wavelength dimensions. If you put these meta material concepts together, you can effectively perform what was once considered magic. There are plenty of amazing things to do with optical metamaterials, but what about other varieties? Can we manipulate heat the way optics manipulate light? Is it possible to make a heater or cooler with heat flow only in the desired direction? In other words, could we make something with perfect heating or cooling? What about sound waves and acoustics? Could we construct a perfect sound absorber out of metamaterials? It turns out moths are already on this particular problem. These materials would really help me with an issue I've been having recording this show. This incessant beeping from a truck backing up outside. My neighbors must be running some kind of warehouse. Imagine a meta material with frequency shifting or selecting properties, changing the pitch of a sound when it reflects off a surface. The possibilities are trippy and endless. Oxetics. A relatively new, exotic, mechanical metamaterials being looked at by scientists for shock absorption and body armor. These substances have what's called a negative Poisson ratio. Just about everything on Earth runs positive in this department. A negative Poisson number simply means the material expands laterally when it's stretched. This is weird and counterintuitive. Same thing happens in reverse with this kind of stuff. If you squish it down, it'll actually get thinner in the middle. It'll be interesting to see what kinds of applications are enabled by oxetic metamaterials. You can actually buy some of this stuff. Zetix Fabrics, it's called, and it's available online. Metal Organic Frameworks, or MOFs, are a relatively new invention. Scientists started playing with MOFs in the 90s. These use clever chemistry tricks to create structures with metamaterial attributes. Long-range order of elements like pores or chemical reaction centers spaced evenly throughout the metal organic compound. These are being looked at for all sorts of applications. Preeminent condensed matter physicist and former guitarist for Blink-182, Tom DeLong, is also into metamaterials research. He claims to have a sample of mystery metamaterial beyond current human technology. He and others are saying the origin of the sample is not of this earth. He bought it at an auction for $35,000 and has been showing it off around the scientific scene. Some chemical and physical analysis has been performed on the chunk of layered material, but I don't see any definite signs of extraterrestrial influence. It appears the material is a synthetic metal stack, and the metals are where it gets a little weird. The photo shows black bismuth, which is a term usually reserved for the oxide. Bismuth and bismuth oxide aren't used for much that I'm aware of. You can find black bismuth sulfide in your stool and on your tongue after you take Pepto-Bismol, but I'm not aware of any other high-tech uses. Someone did go through considerable trouble to make this material, but I don't have a good guess why. I'm not sure what the, bis the bismuth is there for, and I don't know why it's spaced between a silver magnesium zinc alloy. This reminded me of the original Ghostbusters scene, where Ray, Dan Aykroyd, is discussing the metallurgy of Sigourney Weaver's apartment building with Winston Zeddemore, played by Ernie Hudson. It's probably the scariest scene in Ghostbusters, as Ray indicates, the cult leader and architect of the iconic building in the movie, Evo Shandor, used some weird materials in his design. Cold riveted girders with cores of pure selenium, magnesium tungsten alloys, are weird and uncommon, but I don't know if they open a gate for Gozer or the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Looking at the photograph and taking into account the layer thicknesses of the metals in the stack, I would say this material was likely made by physical vapor deposition using a vacuum chamber, probably a metal evaporation system. This stuff could be from another planet, but I'm certainly not convinced on the authenticity of this otherworldly metamaterial. Still, I leave open the chance that I'm wrong, and there is something there. There's a legend in the archaeological community 
that the Ark of the Covenant, the thing from Indiana Jones 1, is being kept in a monastery in Ethiopia. Locked inside the Ark is rumored to be an advanced material, potentially something radioactive, something that couldn't have occurred naturally on Earth. Rumor has it that if you open the container to look at what's inside, you go blind from some kind of mysterious rays. Now this sounds familiar. That's right out of the movie. The interesting part is the church in Ethiopia, where the Ark is reportedly housed, has been guarded by generations of trusted priests. Many of them went blind after being around the artifact for a while. This, to me, points to something potentially radioactive in the area. My dream is to go to Ethiopia and have a look at the thing myself. I always loved Indiana Jones. Who would have thought there would be something true behind the story of the Ark of the Covenant? I wonder how many legends and myths have a basis in reality. How many stories of magic contain truth? Maybe reality isn't as straightforward as we would like to believe. With the advances in science and technology, it's possible humankind is only waking up to the deeper truths and mysteries out there. This is Chris Rankin, Fanadium. <laughs>